Its Channel Islands have a spectacular Anglo-Norman heritage, including the endangered patois Guernsey and Gerier, a very rich agricultural history, many prehistoric dolmens and standing stones, and concrete coastal defences from the German occupation. Legends are tied deeply to the coastal landscape in landmarks, rock formations and place names. The legend of the Plank, where Jersey was separated from France by merely a beam, gives voice to ancient sea level rises as evidenced by petrified peat bed forests sealed beneath the intertidal zones at St. Juan. The arid sand dunes of Le Kenneve in Jersey were legendarily formed after an overwhelming storm in 1495. This was divine vengeance against the inhabitants who plundered five wrecked Spanish vessels. The tales emerge from the vulnerability of the coastal community to unpredictable weather. The sea also brings threats of unwelcome invaders, as, it ev as is evidenced from the multiple coastal fortifications and also intangible folk tales. In Guernsey, an entire art fairy army invaded, killing all the men and leaving the islanders as descendants of the fairies. This legend was perhaps a folk memory of the 14th century attack by Yvonne de Gaulle. Spectral soldiers haunt German fortifications, repeating memories of traumatic World War II occupation. These stories shape how locals and tourists engage with and envisage the island landscape, forging a sense of place and history, hinting at a supernatural realm. The rich folklore generates an intensity of space and an abundance of uncanniness, where everything is smaller, yet more defined. Michel Foucault outlined the principles of heterotopia in Of Other Spaces, counter spaces which are separated in space and time. Islands, like heterotopias, are both open and closed, accessible by boat and cut off by the sea. Haunting coastal folklore helps generate a heterotopia, creating a dark lens through which to view the sunny landscape. The promise of the eerie supernatural threat is always lurking. Foucault's concept of heterotopia can be used as a lens to explore the folkloric coastal landscapes, helping us understand how different groups might engage with the folklore of island spaces. Peter Johnson describes Foucault's sketchy, open-ended and ambiguous accounts of heterotopia, which are relatively minor texts in his corpus of work. However, Johnson argues that heterotopia can be used cautiously as an initial conceptual method of analysis by researchers wishing to explore interdisciplinary approaches to space. Heterotopias provide a mode or style of study or archaeology that shows and describes instead of revealing and explaining. Heterotopias are vaguely defined as counter sites, an enacted utopia attached to a physical location encountered in almost every culture. Like islands, for mainlanders, they are delineated by their difference and dislocation from the routine of every day. Heterotopias are other spaces. Folklore is connected to island landscape features through place name or story. This place is altered and set aside, othered with multiple layers of meaning. Heterotopias, Foucault notes, always presuppose a system of opening and closing that both isolates them and makes them penetrable. Island life, bounded by the sea and reliant on ships to bring goods and people and take away exports, is also subject to a system of opening and closing. Furthermore, Foucault describes a ship as a heterotopia par excellence, a floating piece of space, a place without a place. Closed in and given over to the infinity of the sea, like the ships that supply them, the sea provides a boundary for islands. Those coming here must travel. Islands are both connected and also cut off. When winter fog or storms descend, the islands become difficult to access, causing delays. Heterotopias, like islands, present an intensity of space. They are macrocosmic or microcosmic and Replicate, exaggerate or reduce another world coming into various forms, including prisons, libraries, cemeteries and even the Persian Garden. Knowledge of the landscape and experience of space is heightened when lifestyles are experienced in tiny geographical areas, 
generated after generation. Like a museum or a library, islands can be spaces of indefinitely accumulating time. Every hedgerow and field have memories and folklore mapped onto the landscape. Social networks are tight. In an island, events and material culture accumulate in a bounded space, like layers of the soil in the archaeological landscape. Previous promotions of Channel Island heritage to tourists have focused upon walking through deep time, visiting the past where one location can juxtapose and accumulate multiple eras. Islands become a microcosm, small research lab laboratories for the study of climate change, species or culture. An island, like a garden, sits in a culturally separate space for play and thinking. Islands like gardens represent a flexible container for fluid emotions, hope and joy, fear and grief, anger and jealousy. Island spaces, when read as heterotopias, can juxtapose the real space, several sites that are themselves incompatible. The Channel Islands are separated from the British mainland with strong historical connections to Normandy. They're culturally and politically different, but still complexly interconnected with their neighbours. Jersey became a popular visitor destination during the 19th century, the period in which the first recorded versions of local folklore were often printed. Tourists envisaged the island as a place to escape with beautiful, beautiful scenery, a kind of charmed fairyland, a liminal space on the edges of Britain. As recent tourism slogans captured, it is Brit-ish. Travellers have a preconceived vision of islands as halcyon spaces. Holidays might be viewed as a heterotopic time space. Foucault considered heterotopias linked to periods of time when men arrive at a sort of absolute break with their traditional time. He provides the example of a Polynesian vacation village, which removes time and compresses it for a short vacation. Dahini and Decorta note that heterotopias belong to a time of neither work nor act, and a space in which, which suspends the everyday and makes room for bathing, rituals, games and cultural contests. The time of sacrifice, gifts, play and squandering. Holidays have features of heterotopia, relieving individuals from the drudgery of everyday time. Being extraordinary as opposed to mundane, ordinary in character or of the everyday. They represent a break from everyday experience. An island holiday is a time marked out from every day in a space which is also distinct. Benjamin Clark's Tourist Guide to the Channel Islands, 1879, suggests a packed excursion itinerary where he guides visitors to supernatural spaces such as Devil's Hole, Druidic Harbour or Witch's Rock. Islands, like Persian garden heterotopias described by Foucault, represent order amidst a sea of wilderness and chaos. An eco-critical or even eco-gothic lens can strengthen readings of islands as heterotopic spaces. They are small havens, generally tended and inhabited by humans, separated from the surrounding wilderness of ocean and nature unbridled. By applying this methodology to island spaces, we can see them as havens amidst the wild ocean. Simon Estock explains how the cons constantly changing environment causes horror and ecophobia. It is self-abandonment lack of control and sheer unpredictability that such an environment threatens to entrench. The result is madness. Islands are also at the mercy of wild nature, threatening to overwhelm and surround. The sea erodes the cliffs or deposits high sandbanks, brings coastal flooding, wild storms, fog and even seaborne enemies. It was once connected to mainland France, but was cut off by the rising sea levels after the Ice Age. The petrified peat beds of St. Wands, the remains of a Neolithic forest sealed beneath the beach in the intertidal zone, evidence this. Harsh winter storms uncover these ancient forests, which lie on the beach as sodden, soggy deposits. They sit as haunting fragments of trees that once were, repeatedly being covered and uncovered. 
They stand as evidence of past climatic events and how the island itself was formed by rising sea levels. W. Please, in an account of the Isle of Jersey in 1817, tells the legend of the plank or small bridge that people passed over to get to France, paying a small toll to one of the French abbeys. He explains the tradition of the ancient forest which had been absorbed by the sea. Please observedly highlights that this legend originated in real events, confounded with others or obscured by an admixture of fable, become, in the process of time, enveloped in a mysterious darkness. The end of the plank reflects climate change and sea level rises. Historically, islanders recognised the peculiar peat beds and told the legend to explain this uncanny geographical feature. The peat beds and recent archaeological investigations in the intertidal region of the Violet Bank allows us to explore the deep time of the island. Packham, Alder and Passy highlight that the tidal world has its own distinct temporality that finds expression here as a kind of temporal collapse, helping us to step beyond familiar ways of engaging with the natural world. The coastal area presents us with a landscape of liminality, but also othered space with deep historical value. Like a heterotopia, Packham, Alder and Passy note that the shore troubles notions of boundaries and limits. They argue that delineating the shoreline is even more problematic, as in an area where rising sea levels and coastal flooding pose an existential threat to some coastal and island communities reflects the fears of seaborne terrors. The large arid sand dunes of Kenevay, or the Kenevay, in St. Brellards were legendarily formed after an overwhelming storm. Folklorist Edith Carey describes the space as having the appearance of an Arabian sandy desert amid the fertile agricultural land. She recalls the tradition of the 1495 storm which rendered the formerly fertile land to sand dune a divine punishment for the inhumanity of the inhabitants who plundered five Spanish vessels wrecked there. A week's visit to Jersey, 1840, quotes the legend of the Kenvey from a manuscript owned by Philip de Cartret. Divine vengeance, an impetuous wind ravaged their fields and, bring it, bringing with it an immense quantity of sand, therewith entirely covered them and convert them into an arid and unproductive desert. This tale speaks of threats to the island havens and fear of being consumed by wild nature. The tale emerges from the uncertainty and vulnerability of the coastal community and the unpredictability of the weather. It also provides an explanation for the uncanny stretches of rolling sand dune, a distinct feature of Jersey's west coasts. Furthermore, the legend has a particularly a particular salience in an era of climate change. C also brings threat of unwelcome invaders, as is evident from the island's multiple coastal fortifications dating from the Iron Age to World War II. This too leaves a mark on Channel Island folklore. In St. Juan at Le Trois Rock, the fairies in little Masonic aprons carry round the ancient standing stones to scare potential invaders. Indeed, in one legend from Guernsey, an entire fairy army invaded. Folklorist Edgar McCulloch proposed that the invasion of the island by Yvonne de Gall in the 14th century was the historic origin of this legend, and his Spanish troops have been converted to the denizens of fairyland. The basic premise of the legend, taken from Louisa Lane Clark's version, is that the fairies, from England, invaded the island, seeking Gurdney maidens as wives. A young girl out fishing saw a multitude of little men dressed in green and armed with long bows and arrows coming to fight and make their demands. When the Guernsey men refused to hand over their womenfolk to the fairies, there was a bloody battle resulting in the death of the mortal Guernsey men. La Rouge Rue, the Red Road, supposedly claims its name from the rivers of their blood. Only one man and a boy who hid in an oven in St Andrews survived. The fairies took the women of Guernsey as their wives and repopulated the island in peace. 
the fairies were inevitably called to the recall to the kingdom of invisible beings, leaving their island families behind. Rook reported the Guernsey population were the descendants of that little race of being. In this legend, the islanders are overwhelmed by the supernatural seaborne threat. Supernatural folklore becomes a shorthand for expressing islanders' uniqueness and also the ever-present fear of invasion. Aspect of the island's landscape of memory is formed by the large concrete World War II fortifications acting as omnipresent reminders of the traumatic German occupation. As the only occupied part of British territory, the Germans constructed intense coastal fortifications in the Channel Islands. Some fortifications have been restored as occupation museums, whilst many remain in crumbling decay, waiting to be reclaimed by nature. Many occupation sites have ghost stories or sightings attached to them. Channel Island occupation archaeologist Jenny Carr has examined the intangible ghostly elements of the occupation narrative, concrete memory which are often concentrated around the physical remains of occupation fortifications. She recalls how many locals believe these sites to be literally haunted. There are many stories of teenagers scrambling into bunkers and encountering haunting manifestations. Carr describes ghost hunting as a cultural process helping the grandchildren of occupation survivors understand the experience of the occupation and how it relates to their contemporary island life. It is an attempt at witnessing the occupation which is fading from living memory. Like Ketrotopias, occupation era, era constructions disrupt notions of time. They are sites away from the everyday. The untouched fortifications are other sites on the landscape. They are haunted by ghosts and memories. Fortifications seem darker, in a state of physical decay. These archaeological features in the landscape ruinous and often perched on stark granite cliffs. For Carr, the abandoned fortifications do not just provide a tangible legacy, they also have the intangible legacy in the form of memories, trauma and psychological impact pinned upon them. They are sites of traumatic memories, sometimes decaying, haunted by ghosts, historical or for some supernatural. Carr notes bunker restoration and ghostly exploration allow islanders to encounter the landscape as it is now, as it was then at one and the same time. A person experiencing a ghostly apparition or even a memory for the occupation generation can see the world during the 1940s occupation and also experience the modern ruin. Occupation sites have their own supernatural folklore which gives voice to landscape memories perceived down the generations. There are ghosts of German soldiers protecting fortifications and also victims and slave workers. Carr argues that ghosts can be a lens through which to understand the legacy of conflict and its impact upon successive generations as the intangible heritage of war. The ghosts for many are a lingering haunting of a time of trauma, a means to experience and understand the occupation. Ruth Hayholt notes that ghosts do not merely belong to the past, they are current, present entities that exist or at least manifest in whatever manner, somewhere. The sites of the occupation literally pin memories of trauma into the landscape. They are ever present and the ghosts in some circumstances give voice to such emotions. Bunkers, as Carr points out, have folkloric parallels with prehistoric and dolmen sites. Many bunkers were either covered with earth after the war or have become half buried, especially at the Canavé sand dunes, reclaimed by nature. They resemble the hoogs in chambered tombs, often named after or folklorically connected to the fairies. Whilst the bunkers are guarded by German ghosts, the hoogs are guarded by the sometimes hostile Le Petit Fecho. Carr notes the possibility that local readiness to access the presence of these ghosts is because it taps into pre-existing folk beliefs and cosmologies. When going for a landscape walk on the Jersey coast, it is likely that you will encounter Neolithic sites near German fortifications. Both are hollow hills. Indeed, at La Hook B, a German fortification is sunk into the ground just beside the huge passage Graves Earth Mound, and an air raid shelter was dug into the mound itself, all forming part of the same heritage complex. The supernatural legends of fairies, the various local spectres, and also occupation ghosts all sit side by side in the landscape. 
For Channel Islanders, who often have strong knowledge of their landscape, these ghosts and supernatural spectres are very present, even if they are imagined and not considered as objects of personal belief. The lenses of eco-gothic and heterotopia can help us examine some of the contested, sacred and even traumatic sites of the island landscape. Islands are particularly useful and receptive to these methodologies as spaces with geographical boundaries defined by the seascape. Channel Island supernatural folklore is a means to engage with landscape, to bring out stories of the past. It can foster a sense of care for the beautiful island's ecology and valuable archaeology. Viewing the island landscape through a heterotopic lens can help break down disciplinary boundaries between folklore, archaeology, ecology, history, heritage, architecture and literature. It even has implications for contemporary Anthropocene studies. Chandler and Pugh consider how Islands are worked with as important sites of relational entanglement in order to generate new approaches to knowledge and understanding. As Johnson notes, heterotopia disturbs and unsettles wherever it sheds its light, cultural spaces, disciplinary borders and notions of subjectivity. Heterotopic methodologies promote new ways of understanding the Channel Islands charmed island space allowing us to walk through deep time, stand in numinous wonderment and reverence as those erecting dolmens and menhirs did, becoming intimately knowledgeable of the island landscape. In a time of environmental peril, the eco-gothic lens adds further clarity to this approach. Cage notes that the eco-gothic is frequently so disturbing and so compelling because it pits the protagonist against the natural world in ways that emphasise the connection between the two. Through wonder and terror comes the acknowledgement that something monstrous and alien is both like and unlike ourselves. The eco-gothic lens makes nature strange and allows us to hold our natural environment with a sense of awe and respect. Coastal folklore makes us encounter the uncanny and unfamiliar in nature. It makes us feel unsettled. It disturbs but also fascinates us. From this fascination and understanding, we can foster ethics of care and responsibility towards vulnerable natural environments.